Unbeknown to either of us, Jerry and I have both chosen a very similar quote from the same paper to kind of introduce this topic. Um, the one I chose was this one. It says almost exactly the same things, um, except that it brings in explicitly the concept of cost. Now, I think when we are choosing a mixed mode survey design, just like almost any other survey design choice that we make, there's actually a trade-off that we have to make between costs and various other things which impact on various different types of survey errors. And I think that's going to be the underlying theme of this session. Um, the very recent interest, or explosion of interest, should I say, in mixed mode surveys, I think is largely stimulated by um, the, the ease with which we can now carry out web surveys and this notion that the marginal cost of collecting data by that way must be something close to zero and therefore we could save an awful lot of money. Um, now, to some extent, um, I may try to explode that myth, but I think that's part of the motivation as to why we're looking at these issues. I also just want to make a, a distinction between multi-mode surveys and mixed-mode surveys. Um, a multi-mode survey is where you use different modes to collect different data items. So you may, for example, have um, an interviewer-administered survey, but you have a self-completion component in it for some of the items that are particularly sensitive to the kinds of biases that arise when an interviewer is asking the question. That's a multi-mode survey, and that's a type of design that we tend to use for reducing measurement problems, if you remember the four bullet points that Jerry had just now. Um, whereas mixed modes are a bit different because the idea is that you can potentially collect the same data items using a different mode for different sample members. So some people will ask particular questions in one mode and different people will answer exactly the same questions in a different mode and then we're going to put them all together and treat it as one survey data set. And that's really what we're talking about in this session. Now, that distinction, I think, is very clear for the second and third presentations today. They're obviously about mixed-mode data collection. Um, the distinction is a bit less clear for my topic of coverage and sampling and so on. Um, but we'll see how that plays out as we go through. Um, now, the motivations for doing this, for considering mixed-mode design, Jerry's already touched on, so I won't say much more about them, um, except to say that I mean, from the research that's been carried out so far into various mixed-mode designs, there are kind of, the, the two main motivations seem to be either reducing costs compared to some single mode alternative or trying to improve the coverage or the participation in the survey um, and that those two seem to be somewhat orthogonal to one another. Um, we don't yet seem to have found survey designs that allow us to achieve both of these things simultaneously. We do have designs that can do either one or the other, but they are very different types of designs. So they have different implications. Depending on what our motivation is, the implications are different in terms of the design. Or it may be that we just haven't found the designs that, that achieve both of these things simultaneously yet. Um, so the designs you end up with, depending on your motivation, are different in terms of the modes that you will combine, the sequence with which you will use those different modes, and so on. And because of that, the coverage, sampling, and participation issues, which is what I'm talking about, may differ between those different types of designs. Um, so just to be clear what types of designs we're talking about, very often we are talking about sequential mixed mode designs, meaning that we try to collect as much of our survey data as possible in one mode, one chosen mode. That's the first in our sequence. We do our best in that mode and then at some point we then decide to follow up all the people who've not yet responded in a different mode and that's the next mode in the sequence. And we may carry on and have a third mode and so on. That's one way of mixing modes, right? Um, and if our main motivation is to try to reduce costs, then what we're probably going to do is use the cheapest mode first. So we get as much data as we can in a cheap mode, and then we only need to follow up the people who haven't yet responded in a more expensive mode. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, where was I? Um, on the other hand, if our, if our motivation is to try to maximize participation in the survey, then we're more likely to go for the highest response rate mode first, get as many people as we can, and then see if we can get some more in a different mode. On the other hand, some of the designs we use are concurrent designs, meaning we use multiple modes at the same time, and they may be selective in the sense that we choose to target a particular mode at one subset of our sample and use a different mode for a different subset of our sample. Or they may be elective in the sense that we give sample members an explicit choice of how they 
want to respond, whether they prefer to do it online or on the phone or whatever. Um, and of course you can combine these things, so you can have a concurrent selective sequential design where you select people into different sequences of modes and so on. So there's a whole range of different ways in which we can mix modes and these have implications. So just to give you an example of a sequential design, you know, let's suppose what we were doing was going with web first to try to minimize costs. Um, and then using some other modes to follow up. What we might do is first of all invite our whole sample to carry out a web survey, maybe remind them, maybe remind them more than once, and then at some point in time we'll decide all those who haven't yet responded, we're going to switch into uh, phase two, and in this case maybe mail them a paper self-completion as an alternative to those who haven't yet responded. Or we could have included that paper self-completion at some earlier stage in the process. And then maybe we're going to have yet another phase where people who haven't responded either on web or to the self-completion questionnaire we then try and carry out an interview with. So there are lots of design choices we have to make around which modes we use, which order we use them in, and what criterion we use for switching from one phase to the next phase of the data collection. So moving on to coverage issues then. Um, mixed modes can, I believe, help us to address some coverage issues. Um, one uh, situation where this often arises is that we have a sampling frame that has inconsistent information for different units on the frame. So some units on the frame we may have an email address for, others we don't, some we have a phone number for, others we don't, and so on. So in order to be able to include all the units in the frame, we kind of have to approach them in different modes. Now, of course, approaching people in different modes doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to then collect the data in different modes, right? So we can approach people by phone and ask them to go online and do a web survey. But there are reasons why quite often that's not the most efficient thing to do. I'll come back to that. Um, the other is, the other occasion when mixed mode surveys can help us with coverage problems is, is not, that our, not that we have one sampling frame with inconsistent information, but that we actually don't have any one frame that gives complete coverage or good coverage of the population and, and we have to combine them. So then we get into the business of, of dual frame uh, sampling methods and quite often those are associated with then using a different mode of approach for the people sampled from each, each frame. Um, so an example of each of those, um, many or several um, general population surveys in the Netherlands select their samples from postal address register, um, others use um, um, population registers. What they often do when they use these address registers is they then try and match phone numbers to the addresses and they have a, a well-developed way of doing that via first of all linking names. And by and large they end up with about 70% successfully having a phone number match. So that means that for those people they can approach them by phone and they can avoid, avoid the expense of having to send an interviewer out into the field. However, they still need to include the other 30%, otherwise you've got biased coverage and you tend to use, uh, they tend to use a face-to-face -face approach for that part of the sample. Um, dual frame, on the other hand, a good example of that is using some kind of random digit dialing or list-assisted sampling to generate sample of phone numbers. In many countries, because of the structure of the phone system, you can only efficiently do this for landlines, so you end up with a nice sample of landlines, but of course, there are households that don't have landlines, so you need some other frame if you want to include those in your survey. Um, and again, there are different ways you may do that, depending where you're doing the survey. One possibility might be a sample of addresses that you then somehow have to screen to find out whether or not they have a landline, and if they don't, they're now in that part of your, your sample. So those are the kinds of things we're talking about. Um, so mixed modes can help overcome those kinds of problems. On the other hand, coverage can also introduce constraints on what you would like to be able to do sometimes with mixed mode surveys. So sometimes we might like to have one of these sequential designs where we try to get as many of the people as possible responding in a cheaper mode, let's say web, and then you follow up with face-to-face. -face. Well, because not all members of our sample are web users and have web access and so on, so on that constrains the extent to which we can maximize the cost efficiencies of this mixed mode design, because there'll be a whole bunch of sample members who are never going to respond in the first mode in our sequence, and we have to decide how we're going to deal with that in the mixed mode context. 
Right? We could simply invite them to the web and then put up with the fact that a lot of them are just never going to respond, or we could try and identify who they are and avoid inviting them to the web if we think they're not able to respond and so on. Um, now that's a very important category because I mentioned that uh, earlier on that the idea that web surveys are very cheap is one of the main drivers of this interest in, in mixed mode data collection in recent years. So a very important issue is dealing with this kind of situation where you want to use web as your primary mode. What are we going to do about the people who are not web users? Um, different surveys have done different things and I've tried to broadly categorize the, the approaches here into three, three categories of approach. One is you forget about the, the people who can't respond by web and you end up with some under coverage in your sample, you end up with a web survey. So it's not a mixed mode survey, but you have non-random under coverage which may be a larger or smaller problem depending on what you're trying to study. Alternatively, you try to include the non-web users in web mode. How do you do that? Well, there are surveys that have done this and they generally try and do it by providing hardware, software, and training of some sort. So they try to encourage people to allow them to, to install a computer at home or they give them some portable handheld device that they have to carry around and so on. Um, and there are some, some examples of panels that have done that. Or option C, and this is where the mixed mode designs come in, you try to include the non-web users in a different mode, which may be easier for these people because they're not used to doing surveys or anything else on the web, um, may be more acceptable. Um, this may have cost advantages, obviously, compared to trying to give people hardware and software. Um, there may be measurement disadvantages. The other presentations will come back to that, no doubt. And there are different ways you could do this. So one might be that you combine web with mail and you basically approach everyone by mail and you invite them to do a web survey if they can, but otherwise give them a self-completion questionnaire. Or you may combine it with an interviewer administered recruitment. Um, and various, various possibilities exist. Um, now, if we want to use, if, if our desire is to do as much as possible of our survey, preferably all of it, on the web, you know, there are sampling issues that we don't really have a good way of sampling, let's say, email addresses, because that's probably the most convenient way to invite people to a web survey, or a sampling frame that even tells us who potentially can respond on the web. So we're probably going to make our initial approach by, by a different mode. Interview administration may be the best, but is obviously very expensive, and you immediately undermine the whole rationale for trying to do it on the web. I'm not even going to talk about non-probability recruitment methods. Um, so what we may do is start off with a, a single mode initial approach where that mode is something other than web, like a male approach. Um, and this design, at least in the UK, may work uh, fairly well if you have a sampling frame that has names on it. Uh, if you're trying to carry out a general population survey, like many countries, we don't actually have a good sampling frame with names on it. We tend to use uh, address frames, and that introduces uh, another problem, which is that um, we then have to rely on people to do their own identification of who at the address should take part in our survey. Very often we want to randomly select one person. If we want to do that, we have to provide a mechanism and instructions for doing that. And there have been a couple of experiments of mixed mode surveys that have tried to do this and have shown that this is a bit of a problem. There is quite a high rate of, of households not selecting the right person to take part in the survey for, for whatever, whatever, whatever reason. And this seems to happen regardless of which method you use, whether it's last birthday, next birthday, household grid, um, with a random selection and so on. So this is a bit of an issue, potentially, that although a lot of these people still take part in the web survey, it's not the sample that ideally we wanted. Could argue it's no longer uh, a strict probability sample. It's very difficult in any situation to control who completes a self-completion questionnaire, and that's no different with a web survey than it is with a mail survey. Um, if anything, we suspect that the chance of, of getting the wrong respondent is actually even greater with the web because that just seems to be the way it is. It's, you can fill in a web questionnaire much more easily without anyone else in the household knowing you've done it than you can a self-completion questionnaire that, is, that has landed on the doorstep and other people may have seen it. Maybe those kind of things are, are going on. Um, okay, moving on to participation, the third of the three, the three uh, uh, issues that I'm, I'm talking about. 
If we, if we start off by thinking about single mode surveys, we generally observe higher participation rates in face-to-face -face surveys than we do in telephone surveys and higher in telephone than with self-completion. Typically, I'm not saying this is universally true, but broadly, um, the, the broadly differences are in that direction. Amongst self-completion surveys, it's not quite so clear, but very often we find that we seem to get higher response rates by mail than on the web. There are various examples of the opposite also being true. Um, however, the composition of response, the types of people who respond, are actually remarkably similar across the modes. Now, again, I'm not saying there aren't differences, there often are, but they're not enormous and quite often they're, you know, they're really quite small, um, which is interesting. If we think about a population that we're trying to study, the black circle here is meant to represent the entire population, if we just carry out a face-to-face -face survey, we'll find larger, large-ish proportion of these people will respond, that's the green survey. Let's compare that to doing a single mode web survey. You know, what we broadly find is that a smaller number of people respond, that's why the web circle is smaller, but a lot of them are the same people who would have responded to a face-to-face -face survey. That's why the, the green and purple circles overlap, right, indicating these are the same people. But some of them aren't, right? And there's this little bit of the purple circle that doesn't lie within the green circle. Those are the people who would respond to a web survey and not to a face-to-face -face survey. Now, that is one of our motivations for mixing modes. We would love to end up with a mixed mode survey that has this coverage, the whole of the blue shaded area. So all the people who would have responded in a face-to-face -face survey still do so, but there are some additional people who respond because they would have only responded to a web survey. Now, this is a thing that I'm not sure we entirely know how to do yet, but we think in principle that that should be possible. So we actually increase our participation rate. To do so, as I said, we need all those people who would have responded face to face to carry on doing so, and we need the, these additional respondents. Um, now, unfortunately, um, as I've mentioned, the average response propensity kind of declines as you go from face to face to phone to mail to web, but the data collection costs also decline in the same order. And I think that's partly why we're finding it very hard to come up with designs that save money and also increase response. Because if you, if you use your modes in the order face to face, phone, mail, web, you don't save any money, it becomes expensive. If you use them in the opposite order, you seem to end up with response rate suffering. Now, you may ask why that is. That kind of implies that there are some people who, if you invite them first to take part in a web survey, say, and you then, if they don't respond, go and knock on their door and ask them for a face-to-face -face interview, those, there are some people who are then not going to um, agree to the face-to-face -face interview. Now, that may seem a little bit strange. Why, why would they change their reaction to someone knocking on their door just because they've been invited to take part in a web survey first? Now, I'm not sure we entirely know the answer to that question yet. We don't know exactly what mechanisms are causing that. We maybe have some ideas, um, but there are several studies that show that's exactly what happens, whatever the reason is. Um, so there are examples of mixed mode surveys that produce a higher response rate than the, the highest, mode, highest response rate single mode survey amongst the modes, um, but to do that, you have to use the more expensive mode first, and you also additionally have to, as we say, exhaust that mode, make all of the efforts that you would have made if it had been a single mode survey before moving on to the next mode. So on the British Household Panel Survey, um, we got about 93% response amongst previous wave respondents. This is a panel, remember, if we, if we just use face-to-face. -face. But if we do that, and then we also follow up the non-responders by phone and try and do a telephone interview with them, we managed to increase the response rate up to 96%. So clearly we've done better by having a mixed mode survey, but we've also increased our costs because we've had all of the same face-to-face -face survey costs plus an additional little telephone survey, if you like. Um, another example is from the British Crime Survey where they had mail followed by web, right? Now you could argue about whether it's true that, that mail gets lower response rates than web necessarily, but you end up here with slightly higher response rate by using them sequentially in this order. But unfortunately, there are lots of examples of the opposite where we end up with a lower response rate um, with a mixed mode survey. So on the uh, Understanding Society, the UK Household Longitudinal Study, um, we had an experiment with a mixture of phone and face-to-face -face where we tried to get telephone interviews first from as many people as possible because they're cheaper, you don't have to send interviewers to travel to people's addresses and then mop up the rest face-to-face -face 
And actually, with phone followed by face-to-face, -face, we got a 67% response rate. With face-to-face -face alone, we got 76. So you can see here, are, here, are, here, here is that evidence of some people not responding in a mixed mode survey, even though they're being offered the same mode in which they would have responded in a single mode survey. Now I'm out of time, so I'm not going to talk about all these examples, but there are a bunch of other examples that show the same difference with a lower response in the sequential mixed modes. I now know of one example in this country that goes in the opposite direction, um, which was the, the, the 1958 birth cohort last sweep, got slightly better response with a mixture of um, um, telephone and self-completion. Um, and final point on participation is that actually most of the studies of mix, comparing mixed modes to single mode studies so far have found very little difference in sample composition. So you don't necessarily improve it much by getting people responding in other modes. You don't seem to damage it either. Where there are differences, they're fairly small. Our hope and you know, the often asserted assumption is that by use, adding in web, we're going to get some of these young, full-time employed, busy people who never respond to any other surveys there's actually not much evidence of that. They're no more likely to respond in a web survey than they are by any other mode. They're, they're actually more likely to say that they would, but they actually then don't. Um, so let me just, in my last few seconds, decide what the final point is. OK, I will skip over that and just go to the conclusion slide. I, I think what, you know, what I would say from this so far is that if we really want good population coverage, then the, popul the, the potential cost savings from using mixed mode rather than single mode may kind of vanish away <laughs> to something very small or, or even zero. Um, and similarly, if we really want to achieve response rates that are as high as we could get in the, the best response rate single mode, the same is true. The potential for cost savings are really very small currently if either of those two things are our A our aims. That may change as we learn how to do things even better than we've done so far. Um, and of course, everything I've said about uh, coverage and participation is tempered by the fact that even if we could get as good coverage, as good participation and save costs, we still then have concerns about the differential measurement, which is what the other um, presentations are going to talk about.